Hello and welcome to the Contemporary Art Evening Auction happening here at Sotheby's London on October the 14th. It's an exciting moment for the city. Freeze London and Freeze Masters return after a forced two-year hiatus. And the October sale always marks the most dynamic moment in the annual Sotheby's calendar. This year, it feels like everything is fizzing with even more energy. Right, so I've got about half an hour let loose to explore this important sale with you. And as you would expect, there are those big names, Richter, Boetti, those post-war masters, but they're joined by the new kids on the block, artists I love, like Flora Yuknovic and Titus Kaffar. And also big names in contemporary art. We've got Freud, Shiraga, and even Banksy. Come on, let's dive in. It's fitting that we're greeted by three works by Gerhard Richter. He's a painter that's a huge source of inspiration for so many artists around the world. Joining me to talk about these impressive works is James Sevier. Hello, James. Richter's been interrogating how to make an image and how an image is received for over six decades. And you really feel the power coming off these walls. Were these conceived as a triptych? No, they weren't. They're actually three individual works and we're selling them next week as individual works, but they do look extraordinary together. Yeah. And it's so rare to have three paintings of this quality in the same private collection that have been together for over 35 years. They're coming from the Helga and Walter Laus collection, which is one of the most extraordinary and important European collections of post-war art. And in fact, these paintings have never left Germany. They've been in the same collection ever since. Wow, okay. I mean, you really feel the energy pulsating on them. Of course, Richter brought the squeegee into art history. He brings this sponge in, he starts working the canvas with this kind of unpredictable method. But I can also see paintbrush marks here. So is this, is this a kind of turning point for him? Absolutely. 1985 was the turning point for Richter, certainly in that decade, but I think one of the biggest moments in his career. In fact, he had his first shows in America in 1985. He had his first show with Marion Goodman and with Sperona Westwater. And 1985, you see this shift in his work from painting purely with the brush to really working with the squeegee. And this painting in the two panels on the left and right, you see this kind of almost battle between the squeegee and the brush. There's mm. a push and a pull you know, creating with one hand and then it's scraping back with another. And as a result, you've got an amazing thickness of the paint in all these paintings, a thickness of paint that's actually unrivaled in most of his abstract paintings. Yeah, I mean, it's extraordinary. It's almost like three dimensional in these parts here. He's an artist, of course, who was known for really bringing photography into the world of painting, brought them together as bedfellows and allowed them to kind of interrogate one another where the, the boundary between you know, realism and abstraction began and end. And of course, looking at this, you think of him as a master who's really making us think about what we're looking at and thinking about depth and thinking about what is it to be abstract. Absolutely, and Richter has described his paintings as photography by another means. And you have to look at his abstract paintings in the same lineage of his early photo paintings yeah. and where he went from there. In the early 1980s, he was producing the candle paintings, and from there he went into the landscape paintings. And in 1984-85, there's this dramatic shift, and he suddenly produces these extraordinary, bright, textured, abstract paintings that from there really influence the rest of his career. Mm. You can see why artists all over the world cite him as such a source of inspiration. There's like a million lessons in this painting, isn't there? Absolutely, and Richter is without parallel. He's an artist like no other, both, both in terms of the versatility and the quality and the range of what he's produced. I mean, he combines Rothko and Pollock and de Kooning and all these other artists, but rather than trying to make the picture play in a sacred space, he's challenging it. He's trying to make it contemporary and bring it, as you said, photography and painting together. I mean, it is very challenging, it's very beautiful. And you know what, it's electrifying. I think it's given me loads of energy for today. Thank you so much, James. Thank you. Right, we're leaving Germany to come to Italy and look at a group of post-war Italian artists, artists like Castellani, who are really pushing and pulling between different mediums. You've got these nails underneath this canvas threatening the surface, so it becomes incredibly sculptural. And really, Castellani is part of a really exciting group of young men who were interrogating what art was and how it should be made. And what I really want to look at is this Boetti, and I'm joined by Isabel Pagman. Hello, Isabel. I mean, it feels so painterly, but it's not a painting. Tell us what it is. It's a tapestry. Um, essentially, was handmade and the idea came from Boetti but he didn't actually execute it. So when we think back of the Arte Povera having a work that comes out of hand woven material is obviously very interesting. This is part of a series that he developed 
from the late 60s, early 70s, right up until 89, with enormous geopolitical changes. Mm. And they are very, very meticulously executed, take a very long time to make. So this one being a super big example of the mapas um, is actually very rare. Um, we see the, the beautiful shimmer that um, even the borders and every aspect of this um, work has. So yes, it, it has that quality mm. of a painting maybe, um, yet it is, um, it's completely made out of red. And so it's, the, it's a vision of the world by Boetti. So he's taken each country and delineated it with the sort of image of its map. So really kind of underscoring the sense of people and the constructive notion of what a nation is. Yes, like many artists, he um, is incredibly interested in the world, our planet, and also in the fluid boundaries that exist between nations, which obviously within that period of time have also evolved a lot. Yeah. And his maps throughout these 20 years that were, they were made really reflected that. Yeah, I mean, of course, because you've got the fall of the Berlin Wall. So there's a, the idea of this map actually becoming like a relic of a past world as the world moves on in a geopolitical sense. It's also fascinating to me that he, not only did he not make it, but where it was made. In Afghanistan, yes. So he would outsource this, um, again, with the idea that the artist is um, the initiator of the idea. And it was then created with an element of chance or maybe um, an element of, of error sometimes that could happen, which was part of the beauty of the creation here, human-made. Um, so sometimes these uh, backgrounds are actually a completely different color. We expect the sea to be blue, but you can find maps where they're or it's pink or, or um, purple even, which are these wonderful variations. And you can see sort of variations within it. I mean, you, you, you know that this is not machine made. But then for me, that brings it back to that idea of playing with the medium because it feels even more painterly as a consequence, all the different slight tones in the blue. Well, it's an absolutely arresting, beautiful thing to look at. Thank you so much, Isabel. Now, from one artist pushing the boundaries of how an artwork is made and received to another, who in fact did so here at Sotheby's. And joining me to talk about a work which is fast becoming iconic is Emma Baker. Emma, you were here when Sotheby's got Banksied. I was. Um, it was three years ago, so it's come back just over three years later. And what an event it was. <laughs> it was quite extraordinary and quite stressful to, to be going through. So the work enters the auction room as one piece, Girl with a Balloon from 2006. The hammer goes down. It does, and it becomes something else entirely. So, you know, a lot of people have focused on the fact that Banksy destroyed his own artwork during the auction, but actually he created an artwork. You know, it was Girl with Balloon, dated from 2006. And a few days later, after the auction happened, it became Love is in the Bin from 2018. So yeah, it, it's just remarkable in that sense how we were all there, this event happened, and it's kind of a moment in history now. I mean, it took everybody by surprise. You can see the footage of people watching the, the the thing seemed to slip out of the frame and start to shred. It, it was supposed to completely shred, and so therefore yeah. be called lovers in the bin, so you would have had all these shredded exactly. fragments in the bin. So the idea, and Banksy put this on his own Instagram, so after it happened at the auction, he put all these series of videos up saying, back in 2006, I put a shredder in a painting, waiting for one day when it would come to auction. And then there was another video that he released where it said, it worked in rehearsals every time <laughs> and you could see it just coming through and then totally ending up on the floor in the bin, which is why it was called Love is in the Bin, but it didn't do that. It uh, malfunctioned, it stopped halfway through and the result is this, which I think ultimately is a more powerful work. Yeah, I mean, arguably it worked out beautifully that, the, that it sort of supposedly backfired in yeah. some way. So there's a huge precedent for destruction as mm. a mode of creation in art history. Totally. You think of Rauschenberg erasing de Kooning's drawing or Jean Tangli making these kind of works that deconstructed in front of the art world's eyes. Totally. The Chapman brothers with Goya. I mean. It's part of a whole art tradition. I mean, it's cheeky, isn't it? But it's also very powerful and clever. I mean, it's yeah. a very, very perceptive insight into the mechanization of the art world. Totally. And, you know, that's what Banksy was doing. He was making a comment on value, on money, the art world, and the establishment. And this is what, on who Banksy is. He's totally anti-establishment. Yeah. You know, we're not the first institution to have been banksy I know you know this. Yeah, I used to work at the British Museum and I got banksy yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, like, around 2004, he was pranking, or not pranking, or just doing these performances, these artistic happenings where he was inserting his own works in these revered institutions, such as the British Museum. Mm. He did it with Tate, he did it with MoMA, he did it with the Louvre. 
So, I mean, 2018, he did it with us. And I think it was a moment in his market where prices were beginning to just go a little bit nuts. And I think he wanted to play with that and to really pull the rug from out, out mm. from under us. Mm. And we fell for it hook, line and sinker. Mm. But I suppose the irony <laughs> is he's become an even more popular artist. He's become even more famous. His Instagram went through the roof. People came and queued in the rain yeah, to see this. They did. I mean, it wasn't... It wasn't the end of the story. It was almost just the beginning of a totally new chapter. Totally. A new era for Banksy. I think, you know, as an observer seeing this event, it's, it, it's brought his work to a lot more people, uh, a lot more collectors we see purchasing or bidding for works by Banksy, not just sort of people interested in street art. It's people who are interested in present day masterpieces. Mm. So someone might bid on a Monet, they also might bid on a Banksy like this. So it really has opened out his work to a whole different remit of people and just reinforced his relevance and his importance as an artist today. Yeah, well, it's exciting to see it come back. Well, obviously the whole world is gonna be watching yep. this one go under the hammer. <laughs> Absolutely, and we're just hoping that it's going to be a lot less stressful than last time. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. Thank you. Now, from an anonymous artist who used stealth with a little help of electronics to produce a work, to someone who used their body in a radical way to produce a painting, I'm here to talk to Marina ruiz Colima about this work, which is very dynamic, and it feels even more dynamic when you know how it was made. Tell us. Yeah, so um, this painting was made by Kazuo Shiraga in 1961. He was part of the Kutai Art Association. And what this association um, was all about was making new work every day. His technique was very particular. He would hang a rope from the ceiling and then pour the paint directly onto the canvas, which he had placed on the floor. and um, then he would swing from this rope. And we can see here the gestures of him traversing the canvas with his feet. Um, it's such a tactile um, canvas, but also we can almost feel the physicality of Shiraga swinging um, across the canvas and making these wide uh, sweeping gestures and pushing the paint all around the canvas. I mean, it's just extraordinary, the idea of the acrobatic mm. painter. And this is not just a visceral, extraordinary work, it's also conceptual. Tell me about what it's based on. Absolutely. This work is part of the Water Margin series, uh, which are all based on the tales of the Water Margin. Um, this is a Chinese classic. It's an epic novel that was written in the 14th century. And Shiraga was given a copy, an illustrated copy, when he was a teenager. And he became absolutely obsessed. This sparked a great interest in Chinese culture in general. And um, all the works in this series are titled uh, after the names of the characters in the novel. There is 108 of them. <laughs> And some of them were heavenly creatures, uh, others were uh, earthly demons, and they all fought this war. And we can almost feel this sense of a battle, an epic battle going on on the surface of this canvas. Absolutely. I mean, I'm not familiar with 14th century classical Chinese literature, but I want to be after I look yeah. at this painting. And I know that it comes from a very special collection Absolutely. belonging to an artist. I love it when an artist loves other artists. This is the greatest um, honor for us uh, to be able to to offer a work that has belonged in the collection of Anish Kapoor. And um, it's not only an incredible thing to be able to offer something with an amazing provenance, but also to get a glimpse into the mind of someone who is an artist himself, but who is also a collector, and who, um, which artists he appreciates and he thinks of, and maybe he is inspired by when he's producing his own work. Um, I personally see uh, a glimpse of Kapoor in these canvases, his interest in pigment and this beautiful colors, but also the expressivity of the paint, how he's interested in, in the materials, in the texture. Um, you can almost see everything in this canvas. Yeah, they're two radical artists. Mm. You can see them here together Absolutely. communing in some way. Yeah. Thank you so much, Marina. Thank you. We're moving on from a visceral abstract painting now to an early drawing by Lucian Freud, a very finely detailed work. Joining me to talk about it is Tom Edison. Hello, Tom. Tell me, where is Freud in his life when he makes this? So this is a work on paper from 1951. So Freud is in his early 30s at this point and really had been working in earnest for 
the, the past decade, really. Um, this is a really fascinating uh, point in his career. This is a painting in Connemara in the west coast of Ireland. Mm. And he went there for the second time in 1951 with his then wife, Anne. And it really um, was the start of a love affair with Freud and Ireland. And what we see here is a really wonderful, meticulously executed um, with high degrees of scrutiny and observation, um, which is so emblematic of Freud's career mm. from his works on paper mm. in the 40s and early 50s throughout his paintings. And if you look closely here, you just see such painstaking detail yeah. um, and observation. You have this wonderful steamboat um, on the shore um, of Connemara. Um, this was a boat, I think, which used to take day trippers from sort of Cashel Hill, which you can see in the distance. But what Freud's done here really is you really get a sort of focus. You see he's, he's left all of the sky, left the mm, shore, mm. and it's really pinpointed down onto the main focus of, of what he's looking at. It's amazing, isn't it? Because he allows the paper to do the work for yeah. him. So you really get the sense of the time and space. All this, half of it's blank, really, but yet totally. it feels like a very intense, very realistic kind of work. I mean, the, the different styles of cross-hatching, I mean, it's like he's looking at someone like Ghirlan Dio, an Italian Renaissance master. This is magnificent. Yeah, it's, it it's really is so tight and focused. And when you step back, you don't quite see all the details. You say it's sort mm. of this big mass, but it's so... Um, linear and you get to see little boats further down the shore and this Connemara pony next to the wall who's tied up. And so at this stage it's not like he's making lots and lots of paintings, I mean drawing really is at the core of his practice. Yeah pretty much from the 40s the predominant nature of his work was works on paper um, and you get a few paintings in the late 40s um, of his wife Kitty Garman um, and a few other protagonists but really drawing was the real focus, mm. he was so uh, intent on it. Um, and it really stems um, the foundations of the rest of his career. Yeah. When we look, when we think of his paintings, you know, the grand, big, broad brushstroke paintings of the sort of 90s and, and 2000s, the foundations of which are that huge uh, meticulous observation that yeah. is so, so prevalent here in this drawing. Well, it just has this absolutely beautiful, powerful, quiet energy. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, Kate. Moving on from a British master to less established names, I'm going to be talking to Hugo Cobb about these Hi, artists. Hi, Hugo. Yeah, these are our young and emerging artists in the cell. Many of them are appearing in a Sotheby's Evening Cell for the first time. Great. This is Miriam Kahn. Yep. We have this wonderful painting by Hilary Petchis. This from the South African artist Singer Sampson and this amazing group portrait by Salman Tour. Wow, I mean, I really love Freeze Week because it is about seeing the greats, but it's also about experimentation, all these Absolutely, younger voices. Yeah. I mean, this for me is such a good example of that. Flora Yuknovic, who I used to live down the road yeah, from. Yeah, this one we're really particularly excited about. I, mean, I think first and foremost, this is just a, a dazzling painting. The pure energy of the brushstrokes and the way that she blends figurative and abstract modes of depiction. You know, that's something that's really, really intentional by this artist. She's mm. spoken about blending the, the macho abstraction of the contemporary era with the prettiness of the old masters. Yeah, and of course, she's an artist who's only born in 1990, but she rubs shoulders so seamlessly with those Rococo masters. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and out of them, I would say that, that Fragonard is the one that this picture is most directly based from. Yeah. But she's not just adopting their language and imitating it. She's actually subverting it. Mm. You know, where Fragonard was creating these, these very pretty, as we say, scenes full of blushing nudes, they were absolutely titillation for the male gaze. Mm. Meanwhile, Yuknovic's figures refused to be seen. So it's a very, very intentional point there. Yeah, she really subverts that traditional male gaze in Absolutely, art history. Yeah. And, and actually, she gives us a painting for the 21st century. And I love the way that you kind of are pushed and pulled, thinking about the figures, but then thinking about the brush strokes, and actually the bravery of it, to have it be so dynamic with the drips of paint here, these really quite aggressive marks at the top, and mm -hmm. actually just passages where you have bare canvas. So there's yeah. a lot happening. I mean, it's extraordinary that she's so technically skilled um, at such a young age. Yeah. And although we speak about the old masters a lot standing in front of her work. I think you can also look to, to contemporary painters, particularly Cecily Brown, mm. who she's regularly compared with. And so this is the first time in the evening sale for her? Yeah, and I think it's really, really exciting to, to show Yuknovic's work alongside such painters as Gerhard Richter, yeah. Bridget Riley, Yayo Kusama, and, and see her rubbing shoulders with these guys and, and absolutely going toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. Yeah, really deserving her place. Well, I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens. It's a really special work. Thank, Thank you. you 
from one artwork that brings the ideals of art history through to the present age to another. And joining me to talk about it is Antonia Gardner here in the Contemporary Art Day Sale. Antonia, this is by Titus Kaffar, and it's quite a thing to look at. Indeed it is. So this is one of his iconic shred paintings. It's Marta from 2008. It's one of our top lots of the day sale. To make these, as you can probably see from the work itself, it takes a huge amount of work. He first copies old master paintings, really, really very delicately painting them. And then he uses all sorts of different methods to kind of cut, puncture, some of them are covered up. He uses oil rag to kind of deconstruct the image. So this one's really been shredded and it, it looks like it started out quite precise with a scalpel and then obviously it's got very frenetic and there's this amazing push and pull and you get these almost these puncture marks Punctures. as well. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So he, he cuts through them again, as you say, it's very, very precise um, way of cutting through them. And in doing so, he kind of really references this long um, art historical lineage where, you know, artists like Lucio Fontana slash through the canvas, opening up two-dimensional space to the three dimensions. And here he uses it to address kind of art history and the kind of the blank spots in art history, you know, where black figures have been ignored uh, by, by, by art history. So it's a sort of a very exciting moment where you have an African-American artist in the 21st century looking back at art history, but repurposing it, repurposing it, using it to his own ends, exactly. and, and actually giving us something entirely new. I mean, it's, it's a performative kind of art, isn't it? Definitely, yeah, there's a lot of performance in it, and you kind of, it, the, the final result is very much, you can feel the processes that, have, that he's been through to create them. Yeah. It's kind of very, it's very physical in its being as well. And there's another work over here which is so physical I can feel it kind of pulsating <laughs> Emanating. off the wall. Um, this is by Jade Fado Jatimi. She must be one of the youngest artists in the sale. Yeah, she's one of the youngest, and actually she's the youngest in the whole Tate collection, which is a super exciting thing. And this is a muddled mind that's never confined. And what's particularly incredible incredible about this work is the extraordinary colour that you just mentioned. Um, she takes her influence from all sorts of different places, anime, and that Japanese influence you can definitely get from the present work. Yeah, I mean, I think what's amazing is that the colour palette is so robust and that it's so seamless, but yet actually there's fluoro in mm. here, things are clashing with each other, there's things which are translucent and gentle, other parts which are kind of quite aggressive. There's an entire kind of cacophony of noise being marshalled by her here. Definitely, and it's, she kind of creates them very much as a sense of identity, you know, there's this real playfulness to them as well, kind of elements of childhood with these really, as you mentioned, the fluoro colours popping through. Um, it's just an extraordinary cacophony of brushworks, as you say. So do you think that this really is a sort of painting about her identity or finding identity, or are we looking at kind of like an inner psychological working of this young artist's mind? She's spoken a lot about how it's reconstructing her identity on the canvas, and I think that's very much what you see here. You know, there's moments of calm, these kind of huge moments of passion and mm. injection of colour and vibrancy in it. Yeah, wow. I mean, it feels like it has just literally been Jumper. painted. Yeah, and it just feels like it's still wet. It feels like the energy of her is still on the wall. And it is. This is this is from 2021. Um, and it's actually being sold to benefit WWF and Art for Your Climate, which is a really amazing cause of how kind of bringing the art world um, into the climate issues that are happening in the world today. Oh, okay, amazing. Well, I love it even more than that. Thank, <laughs> thank you so much, Antonio. No problem, thank you. From one artwork charting a complex emotional landscape to another, and joining me to talk about it is Oliver Barker, who's actually the auctioneer for the Contemporary Art Evening Sale. Hello, Kate. Good morning. Hello, Ollie. I mean, I've just seen the Rego exhibition at the Tate Britain, and I was just staggered. She's just such a singular artistic force. You know, I think it's, it's so right. When you look at the surface of these pictures, it's very difficult to tell the kind of the dense complexity of everything that's really going on behind them. But th this is no different. This is a work which was created uh, at the beginning of a series called the Dog Woman series in mm. 1994, when uh, uh, Paula was coming to terms really with the death of her husband Victor Willing and of course you know she uh, up until that point hadn't really been an artist in her own right but of course she begins to eclipse uh, him of course and very much in pictures like this and I think the Dog Woman series really is all about um, women being sort of trivialized almost as a bestial force but of course it's much more it's womanhood sort of really being celebrated on its own sort of shape and also taking a wide range of influences in this case actually from Portuguese kind of legends in fact uh, of a woman in fact who lived in isolation and went mad living in isolation with wind sort of coming down her sort of chimney and ended up eating and devouring the animals that were around her very rego-esque stuff really um, especially course, post lockdown thinking about the madness of isolation yeah that's absolutely right but uh, you know I think that here is an artist really at the height of her powers yeah 
not only sort of in terms of kind of addressing the kind of the man woman and the divide between the two but also kind of technically really attacking you know pastel and i look at these pastels and this one being actually on canvas and feel this is you know the best pastel pastels kind of technique maker since digger yeah you know the the the, the level of kind of you know mastery of that medium a, a notoriously difficult medium is quite extraordinary and i think the other thing also is that this work is notable as the end of the dog woman series the very last one and it's titled good dog and you can see that she uh, autobiographically in the picture is taking this of somewhat subservient sort of yeah. pose uh, almost looking up at her master to say, yes, I've been good, but at the same time being assertive and being strong and being feminine. Uh, there's so much going on here. Yeah, I mean, always with Rego, you get all of this psychological depth. I mean, yes. it's very compelling. Well, I've had the most glorious time sleucing my way through art history good. with all these amazing yeah. pictures. Thank you so much for having me, and I'm going to hand over you. to you for the closing remarks. Absolutely. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, um, Ladies and gentlemen, in addition to today's tour, you, of course, have the opportunity of viewing ourselves physically here at Sotheby's in New Bond Street, and we are opening our doors on Saturday the 9th of October at midday. And of course, all of the pictures and works of art you've seen today are also online. Sotheby's.com, where you can see the highlights of the day sale, which is taking place. The bidding opens, in fact, on the 8th of October, concluding on the 15th of October. And again, all of the details of the works are available on Sotheby's.com. The evening sale of contemporary art will be taking place from 6 p.m. on the 14th of October. And of course, as usual, in our own unique style, we will be live streaming that auction through Sotheby's.com and our Facebook channels as well. And we very much look forward to welcome you physically, virtually. If our experts can be on hand, please reach out to them, contact them as well. They very much look forward to helping either online again or indeed over the telephone and emails, both in London here, Europe, Asia and New York. And after that, thank you very much for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed the tour and we very much look forward to welcome you here at Sotheby's. <laughs>